The Night Wire, New York, September 30. C.P. Flash, Ambassador Elwell died here today. The end came suddenly, as the ambassador was not alone in his study. There is something ungodly about these night wire jobs. You sit up here on the top floor of a skyscraper and listen in to the whispers of civilization. New York, London, Calcutta, Bombay, Singapore. But they, they're your next door neighbours. After the street lights go dim and the world has gone to sleep, alone in the quiet hours before between two and four, the receiving operators doze over their sounders and the news comes in. Fires and disasters and suicides, murders, crowds, catastrophes. Sometimes an earthquake from a catastrophe, with a catastrophe list as long as your arm. A night wire man takes it down almost in his sleep, picking it off on his time waiter with one finger. Once in a long time, you prick up your ears and listen. You heard of someone you knew in Singapore, Halifax or Paris long ago. Maybe they've been promoted, but more probably they've been murdered or drowned. Perhaps they just decided to quit and took some bizarre way out. Made it interesting enough to get in the news. But that doesn't oft happen often. Most of the time you sit and doze and tap, tap on your typewriter and wish you were home in bed. <laughs> Sometimes through queer things, oh, queer things happen. One day, the other night, I hadn't got over it yet. I wish I could. You see, I handled a night by his desk in a western seaport town. The name is Doesn't Matter. There is, rather was, only one night operator in my staff, a fellow named John Morgan, about forty years of age. I should say, a sober, hard-working sort. He was one of the best operators I knew what is known as a double man. That means he could handle two instruments at once and type the stories on different typewriters at the same time. He was one of the few men I kn ever knew who could do it consistently, hour after hour, and never make a mistake. Generally, we used only one wire at night, but sometimes, when it was late and the news was coming fast, the Chicago Denver stations would open a second wire, and then Morgan would do his stuff. He was a wizard, a mechanical automatic wizard, which functioned marvellously, but was without imagination. On the night of the 16th, he complained of feeling tired. It was the first and last night I ever heard him say a word about himself. I had known him for three years. It's just three o'clock, and we were running only one wire. I was nodding over the reports at my desk, and not paying much attention to him when he spoke. Jim. He said, "Does it does it does it feel close in here to you?" Why? No, John. I answered. Why? I opened the window if you like. Never mind. He said, "I reckon I'm just a little tired." That was all that was said. I went on working. Every ten minutes or so, I would walk and take a bottle of coffee and then stacked up neatly beside the typewriter as the messages were printed out in chocolate. It was, must have been twenty minutes after he, he spoke that I noticed he opened up the other wire and was using two, both typewriters. I thought it was a little unusual, as there's nothing very hot coming in. On the next trip, I picked up the copy from both machines and took it back to my desk to a sort of depress the first while I was running out the usual sort of stuff I just looked over it hurriedly then I turned to the second part of the copy I remembered it particularly particularly because the story was from a town I never heard of Sick Bureau here is a dispatch I saved in duplicate of of it from our files Zibugu September 2016 CV Bulletin the heaviest mist in the history of the city settled over the town at four o'clock yesterday afternoon all the traffic has stopped, and mist hangs like a power over everything. Lights of all of only intensity fail to pierce the fog, which is constantly growing heavier. Heavier. Scientists are unable to agree 
as a course, and local wet bureau that was that the like had never occurred before in the history of the city at seven pm last night. Mutual, mutual, mutual authorities, more that was all that, that there was. There was nothing out of the ordinary at the bureau headquarters, but as I say, I noticed the story because of the name of the town. It must have been fifteen minutes later that I went over to the, another batch of coffee. Morgan was slumped down in his chair and switched his green light shade so that the gleam missed his eyes and hit only the top of the two trunk wedges. All the used stuff was in the right hand pile, but the left hand rack carried another story for the room. All the press dispatches came in in takes, meaning that parts of many different stories are stuck together, along together, perhaps with but a few paragraphs of such coming through at a time. The second story was marked Ad Fog. Here is the copy. At 7 p.m., the fog had increased noticeably. All the lights are now visible, and the town is shrouded in pitch darkness. As peculiar as the phenomenon of the fog is occupied by a sickly odour compared to nothing yet experienced here, below the cosmic press fashion was the hour, 3.27, and initials of the operator, J.M. There is only one other story in the pile from the second wire, here it is, second ad, Superman Fog. Accounts as to the origin of the mist diff- differ greatly. Among the most unusual is that of the sexton of the local church, who groped his way to the headquarters in a hysterical condition and declared the fog originated in the village churchyard. It was the first visible a soft grey blanket clinging to the earth below, above the graves, he stated. Then it began to rise, higher and higher, a strange breeze seemed to blow it in its bellows, which split up and joined together again. Fog phantoms, withering in anguish, twisted the mist in queer forms and figures, and then, in the thick, very thick mist of the mass, something moved. I turned and ran from the accused spot. Behind me, I heard screams coming from the houses, bordering on the graveyard. Although the section story is generally discredited, our party has, was left to investigate. Immediately after telling his story, the sexton collapsed and now is now in the local hospital, unconscious. Queer, it's a queer story, wasn't it? Not that we used to do what we used to do. For a lot of unusual stories come in over the wire, but the same week, for some reason or another, perhaps because it was so quiet that night, the report of the fog made a great impression on me. I almost. It was almost with dread that went over to the waiting piles of coffee. Morgan did not move. The only sound in the room was tap, tap, tap by the sounders. It was ominous, nerve-wracking. There was another story from the room in the pile of the coffee. I seized it anxiously. New lead, something fog, CP. The rescue party, which went out at 11 p.m. to investigate a weird story of the origin of the fog, which, since last the late yesterday, has surrounded the city in darkness. Has failed to return. Another, an larger party, has been dispatched. Meanwhile, the fog has, if possible, grown heavier. It seeks to through the cracks in the doors, and it seeks through the cracks of the doors and fills the atmosphere in a depressing odour of decay. It's oppressive, terrifying, bearing with its true profession of things long dead. So residents of the city have left their homes and gathered in the local church with a priest of holding. So this is a prayer. The sign is beyond description. Grown folk and children are alike terrified, and many are almost beside themselves with fear. Amid the whispers of vapour, which partly fell, the church all to him, an old priest is praying for the welfare of his flock. They are turning well and cross themselves from the outskirts of the city. May be heard cries of unknown voices, the echo through the fog, in queer and constant minor keys. The sounds resemble nothing so much as the wind whistling through a gigantic tunnel. But the night is calm, and there is no wind. The second rescue party, more. I am a calm man, and never in a dozen years. Depending on the wires, have been known to become excited, but despite myself, I rose from my chair and walked to the window. Could I be mistaken? or far down in the canyons of the city beneath me, did I see a faint trace of fog? 
It was all my imagination. In the press room, the click of the sound seemed to have raised the tempo of their two. Morgan alone had not stirred from his chair. His head stuck between his shoulders. He tapped the dispatches out on the typewriters with one finger of each hand. He looked to sleep, but no. Endlessly, efficiently, the two machines rattled off, line after line, as relentlessly and effortlessly as death itself. There was, some, there was something about the modernist movement of the typewriter keys that fascinated me. I walked over and stood behind his chair, reading over his shoulder, the type as it became, came into being, word by word. Ah, here is another flash, as if we would see me. There'd be no more bulletins from this office. The impossible has happened. No message has come to this room for twenty minutes. We are cut off on the outside, and even the street full of us. I will stay with the wire until the end. It is the end, indeed. Since four p.m. yesterday, the folk has hung over the city, following reports from the section of the local church. Two rescue parties were sent out to investigate conditions on the outskirts of the city. Neither party has ever returned. Nor has any word received from them. It's quite certain now they will never return. From my instrument I can gaze on the city beneath me. From the position of this room on the thirteenth floor, nearly the entire city can be seen. Now I can see only a thick blanket of darkness. From a custody of lights and life, I fear greatly that the wailing cities heard constantly from the outskirts of the city are the death cries of the inhabitants. They are constantly increasing in volume, are approaching the centre of the city. The, ha- the fuss hangs over everything. It's possible it's even heavier than before, but the conditions are changed. Instead of an opaque, impetual wall of odorless vapour, there now swells and wither a shapeless mass in contortions of almost human agony. Now and again the mass parts. I catch a brief glimpse of the street below. People are running to and fro, screaming in despair. A vast bedlam of sound flies up to my window, and above all, the immense whistling of unseen and unfelt winds. The fog has again swept over the city. The whistling is coming closer and closer. It's now directly beneath me. God, an instant ago. That fast opened. I caught a glimpse of the streets below. The fog is not per- Simply vapor, it lives by the side of each moaning and weeping. Human is a companion figure, an aura of strange and fiery coloured hues. How the shape cling each to a living thing. The man and women are down, flat on their faces, the folk figures caressed him lovingly. They are kneeling beside him. They are, but I do not tell it. Their prone and weaving bodies have been stripped of their clothing. They are being consumed, piecemeal. As a merciful wall of hot, sweeping vapour swept over the whole scene, I can see no more. Beneath me, the veil of vapour is changing colours. It seems to be lighted by internal fires. No, it isn't. I have made a mistake. The colours are from above, reflections from the sky. Look up, look up. The whole sky is in flame. Colours have yet unseen by man or demon. The flames are moving. They are started to intermix the colours are rearranging themselves. They are brilliant that they are so brilliant that my eyes burn. They are a long way off. Now they have begun to swell, to circle out, twisting in intricate designs and patterns. The lights are racing each with each other, a kaleidoscope of unearthly brilliance. I have made a discovery. There is nothing harmful in the lights. They radiate force and friendliness about almost tuneless. But their strength, but by their strength, they hurt. As I look, they are swinging closer and closer. A million miles at each jump, millions and millions of speed of light. Ah, it's a light of coincidence of all light. Beneath it, the fog melts into jeweled mist, radiant, rainbow coloured, of a thousand varied spectra. I can see the streets. Why, they are filled with people. The lights are coming closer. They are all around me. I am enveloped, I... The message stopped abruptly. The wire to Ezra was dead. Beneath my eyes, in a narrow circle of light, from under the green light lamp shade, the dark printer no longer spun itself, letter by letter across the page. 
The room was soon filled with a solemn quiet, a silent, vaguely impressive, powerful. I looked down at Morgan. His hands had dropped nervously at his sides, but his body had hunched up peculiarly. I turned the lamp shade back, throwing light squarely in his face. His eyes were staring, fixed, filled with sudden foreboding. I stepped beside him and could shut on the wire. After a second, the sound of click its answer. Why? But there was something wrong. Chicago was bolting the wire too. It had not been used throughout the evening. Morgan, I shouted. Morgan, wake up. Is it is it true? Someone has been hoaxing us. Why? In my eagerness, I grasped him by the shoulder. His body was quite cold. Morgan had been dead for hours. Could have been his scissors, brain, and alternate fingers that can continue to record impressions, even after the end. I shall never know, for I sh- shall never again handle the night shift. Search in a world that has disclosed no town of the view, wherever it, whatever it is that killed John Morgan, will remain forever a mystery. <laughs>